Hello, and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench is empty bench, which means probably Q&A time again. I've been getting this question a lot over the last couple of weeks, as, and it, it's been the same question about a whole bunch of different devices. The question that I'm getting is, brief description of problem, is this repairable? That can be quite a loaded question to answer, because in the troubleshooting process, you dive down a rabbit hole, and eventually you hopefully get to the bottom and a solution. The problem is, the bottom may lead to another rabbit hole, which may lead to another rabbit hole, which may lead to another rabbit hole, which may lead to another rabbit hole, and you're in a mess with compounded problems and no way to move forward. That can be quite challenging, especially a multi-failure like that. That can be incredibly challenging to work through and get everything up and running again. I do have to assess whether a unit is repairable or not. So I figured we'd do that together on the bench with this as an example. Uh, there is a fair bit of gravity in here. <laughs> so this thing is not light. This is a LCR bridge, a ZM30U, and will probably be a future project on the channel. Uh, unlike the LC meter that I have, the 130, this is an LCR meter. I haven't looked in this yet, and I haven't done a restoration on this quite yet, so this is as received. Um, this would kind of be the process I go through if I'm looking at pictures on the internet, things like that, trying to figure out if there's a piece of equipment that I want to repair or not, and things like that. Gets a little different when it either has a meter indicator or a CRT. There's a couple more things we'll look at, which we'll get into a little bit later in the video. But on this one, the indication down here is, an, is a magic eye tube. One thing to know about magic eye tubes is they'll always be dead. This unit spent a lot of time on, so the shadow angle will probably still be good and bright, but the ring around it will be kind of toast. My uh, IT28 is, an ex is a great example of that. I haven't changed out the magic eye yet. I have them, but I haven't needed to because I'm just going to burn a tube for it to burn out again. So... I'm keeping it because the shadow angle is nice and bright, so when it's actually indicating, it's very bright. It's just the eye is just flat and burned out, and the, um, the response isn't there. So the first thing I want to talk about is, let's say you can't get access to the unit, and all you see is this on online. Well, first off, just from looking through this, I can see that there's dust indication. This may or may not show up very well on the camera. We'll zoom in here. You can kind of see where there's dust here and not there that you might be able to see. That tells me it's been in storage for quite some time. Unit hasn't been operated. Probably shouldn't throw it on power as soon as I get it and turn it on. I will give the unit a once over and I will scrutinize every picture that's available to me if I'm deciding to either restore something or make a purchase to bring something in to restore. I'll look for cracked knobs, things like that. Is everything complete in the front? Are there some wild and crazy knobs like this that I'll have an incredibly hard time sourcing if they're missing? Um, is everything there that's supposed to be there? Are the fuse holders intact? Are they missing a fuse? Um, that could be, that wouldn't be insurmountable, but it also could mean somebody's been in the unit before. Uh, is the unit complete? Is it missing any of the binding posts, missing any knobs? Is the meter glass cracked? things like that. This particular unit did not come with a lid, so it is as is. Uh, if I can get multi-views, I will look at every picture. I'll see how badly the damage is to the paint and the plastics. Uh, in this case, we have, a, we have some rash here, a little bit of rash here. This is just a little bit of um, surface rash. There's no uh, nothing major going on with the paintwork here to lead me to believe that there'd be any internal damage. I'd also look at the corners and the edges. Is anything caved in? Is anything dented? Is anything bent? Um, that isn't necessarily a deal breaker, but it could belie bigger problems underneath. So really screw nice. Is the chassis twisted? I've actually gotten some scopes where they've taken an impact, where the scope has taken an impact back here on this corner where it was dropped and the whole chassis was racked this way and torqued. Um, 
that was uh, not a fun day when I opened the box because that was shipping damage. Uh, so that could happen after the pictures. That's also to make sure some of this stuff makes it through shipping. Some of the stuff that I've had to move around has been exorbitantly expensive to move it around. Um, a Tektronix 576 comes to mind. That has a ship weight of 98 pounds. <laughs> One of them that I ordered showed up in a wooden crate to get it here intact. Uh, I need. It's been the uh, one of the few times I've needed a screwdriver to get into my mail. Uh, how the box and the packaging actually looks. Um, as much as I rely on the mail and the shipping uh, entities, they bring a lot of stuff to my door, which I am very thankful for. Some of the stuff gets beat up. It just happens. But everything looks good and looks good in the pictures. Everything looks good, and you've hit the buy button. It's shipped. It's here, and it's ready to go. What do we do first? Well, first thing is, when it's on the way here, I may familiarize myself with the service manual. Look up, hit the internet for any documentation I can find, see what I need, what I might get into. Are there any known sore spots in the device that I should be aware of? Um, poke around on the forums. Um, great place for information, if you guys are unaware, is the... TechScope's mailing list, the HP mailing list, the EEV blog forum, and uh, and uh, actually any forum you can become a member of where the signal-to-noise ratio is uh, quite high can be incredibly valuable information, and a lot of it's there for the asking. Part of having the YouTube channel is I've had to fix some gear, and I've made some phone calls to ask some pretty dumb questions sometimes. And... Uh, I've gotten to talk to some of the people that built the stuff that I'm working on, which has been absolutely fantastic and wildly incredible um, that there are still places that you can call where you actually may talk to the guy that built the thing that's on the bench. Uh, that just doesn't happen very often. In the case of this thing, there's not a lot of information out there, so i got to dig up. I even have to find a um, calibration routine in here. Um, this is a military unit. Uh, the paint color actually tells me it probably came from the Navy side of things. The Army tended to paint things green. The Navy tended to paint things gray. Um, that wasn't a standard, but that's just kind of what seemed to happen. Poking around on the forums and looking for additional information. The 576, for instance, has a n transformer that's known bad. Uh, some of the 500 series scopes, they have some problems with the high voltage transformers. This is just stuff to know, common common failure modes of the stuff over time that maybe somebody else has run into that could save some troubleshooting time on the bench and um, get the equipment up off the ground and running a little bit quicker. For this, i got to figure out how to use this thing. <laughs> um, it's an, it's, it's a um, LCR meter. That's easy, that's easy enough. But it can take external modulators, it can take external uh, standards, it can take all kinds of stuff. So I gotta figure out what I gotta hook up to the external side of things to get this thing to work right. And I gotta figure out what this meter is supposed to tell me and uh, actually figure out how to make this thing run for the bench. Because I'd love to get some use out of this. Bridges tend to be very accurate pieces of equipment. Even though it's older and it only has a magic eye, we barely have a display. This is still going to take really, really good measurements. Uh, I've got LCR to two decimal places on this unit. So I am, uh, that is uh, pretty fantastic for its age. I can tell you one thing this isn't going to do the leakage measurements that my IT28 can do, but I guarantee you it's going to have better capacitance, inductive, and resistance measurements than my IT28. That's for sure. So everything looks right. We've gotten documentation. Everything looks good. And we're at the bench. First things first, I'm going to gently exercise all the knobs. Can I turn anything? Can I? Is anything bound up? Am I having to force anything? If you have to force any of the knobs, stop and take a look at it. There's a very, very valuable piece of equipment that has known problems with the knobs that if you force the knob, it can get into a world of trouble. This is a perfect example of one of those units that you do not want to force a knob in. This is a 7A29. It's a 1 gigahertz plug-in for a 7000 series scope. 
this knob has a tendency to jam. The problem with that knob jamming does not show up well on camera, but there is tiny plastic tabs that rotate a cam wheel that's in there and these plungers lock up and if you force these and if you force this knob that plastic cracks off and that can be a world of hurt trying to get that fixed back up it's a real quick way to uh, cause some real damage to one of these plugins so just something to be aware of also if you're going to have some of this stuff in storage for a while it's not a bad idea to exercise the knobs every once in a while um, with the equipment off just to keep everything kind of loose. For the equipment that's less used in the lab, every once in a while I just walk in and fiddle with the knobs for a little bit and then reset it back up to its starting positions. So not a bad idea to exercise the knobs just to keep everything from locking up. But back to this guy. So we have a complete unit. None of the knobs are broke. It's not racked. It's not busted. It's not blown up. It's not everything's all good, except the case is missing. No big deal. Survive shipping, and it's here. Do we plug it in? No. First up, we want to inspect the power cord on this. How does it feel? Does it look right? Is the plug safe? I have seen power cords where the copper's sticking out the back of the plug, <laughs> and it's barely hanging on. This one's actually in pretty good shape. Cord doesn't feel too bad, but if you listen, hear that? There, that was a good one. That's the power cord actually cracking. Internally, this cord is dead. We do not want to plug this unit in before we replace the cord on this. So we don't, we're not going to. So feel. Do the knobs move freely? Um, does anything smell burnt? Uh, especially with modern components, uh, you get a computer power supply that blows up. It smells blown up forever. That smell never goes away. So if it smells burnt, take a look at it. One thing you might want to do is put a meter across here. Just see if it measures a dead short or not. A lot of times those go into transformers at least in this older gear, so may or may not show anything. Um, are the fuses intact? Things like that. Open it up. I mean, there's a lot of stuff, especially if you don't buy it new, that loves to wave around the warranty void. Well, if I don't know if it's been plugged in and tested, I'm not going to plug it in. Have a power-up procedure if you're going to power on some of this older gear of just steps you take to gently bring it up, bring it back into service. Every technician ends up creating their own. The only thing I can do is share some of the steps that I go through with some of mine. And it does look like we are loose. So we're just going to pop this out of the case. This should come out relatively easy. I see big light. Ooh, smell. I smell the old electronics. First up, take a look at the inside of the case. This one actually looks in pretty good shape. Look for any blown out burn marks, things like that. Uh, unit 2 of these 8904As actually had that problem. Um, one of the capacitors exploded on the side of the case. And it was really apparent where um, that one came from. They do not make switches like this anymore. Look at this. This is, I, I know, calibration level resistors that use this style of switch and these calibration units. This is incredibly well built. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting this all fixed up and on the channel. Um, nothing looks burnt. I don't want to bend any of these wires. This is a um, dynamic box, not a DC box. So some of this stuff is going to go into calibration. Lots of precision resistors. Inspect the resistors. Make sure nothing looks toasted. Hot resistors are pretty easy to see. They get burn up. We will flip it over. Also, check for completeness. 
Um, I'm looking for discol heat discoloration on any other resistive components, resistive elements, things like that. Uh, do we have a capacitor here that we're going to need to worry about? Probably not. That's a mica block, I think. But we'll take a look at that. We do have selenium rectifiers. Not sure if we're going to replace those in this or not. Might replace those with diodes, but we'll see. Two can caps we may have to contend with. Got some vacuum tubes here, 12AX7 and a 12AT7 it looks like. Here's a perfect example of why that crunchy power cord was bad. Here's our mains cord coming in. Here's our hot side. Hot side's already exposed. The insulation's starting to fail. That's what's crunching in that wire, so this power cord gets replaced before we turn this on. That's just a safety factor. In this one, uh, the power cord does go to the right side of the fuse, so that's not a problem. Although, in doing our incoming inspection, we have some capacitors that are going to need to be replaced. This one, maybe, maybe not. These, these three, for sure. We got some things that look that could potentially be bathtub caps right here, but they are not. This is a transformer, and so is this. So we have two transformers that are shielded, which is good. Those aren't bathtub caps. The bathtub caps, um, they have a polychlorinated biphenol oil in them, and uh, that is on the spicier side of chemicals that can get released in the lab. Um, it is wildly carcinogenic, uh, so follow all the appropriate handling and data sheet recommendations for stuff like that. Uh, know if there's any bigger capacitors, if it's been charged up, if because um, some of this stuff can hold a charge for a little while. Get a zap. Everything looks good. This will be this will be pretty serviceable, actually. I I really like this this unit. They don't they do not build stuff like this anymore. Uh, this is a mica capacitor, so this this block is not a problem. That's going to stay. Look for damage that could have happened. Um, things being out of place, racked, broken, missing, busted. Check the switches specifically. Make sure they're all intact. Nothing's broken. Things like that. This is just a visual inspection for. Um, the candidate of restoration. Some of the stuff, the restoration may not be worth the effort. It may not be a specifically unique or high-value piece of equipment. So it may not be worth the hours and hours and hours it can take to restore a piece of equipment. On the flip side, it could have a high sentimental value to somebody where it is worth a ton of money, even though it's a piece of equipment that's not intrinsically unique it's unique to the per to the person so it could be it could be quite valuable for the individual to get it restored for sentimental reasons as the technician i can't put a value on that everybody has to evaluate that themselves uh, i'm just here to assist in bringing some things back that otherwise would not be able to be look for parts that are known problems Selenium rectifiers hiding way back here. Uh, so those might be fun to get at. I'll have to see what happens. These caps will actually be relatively easy. Change out some of these resistors because they will probably need it. This will probably need quite the rebuild down here in this area. I may even need to separate these two pieces um, to do an appropriate job on the restoration, but the future will tell. Start formulating a plan of how you're going to do the restoration. Where am I going to need to separate parts? How deep do I want to go? What's my goals of the restoration? Things like that. Is it get it up and running? Is it get it up and running to factory spec? bulletproofing it as best as possible to get it up and running, make, taking it to factory spec, taking it all the way to the end. Um, 
you could take a restoration where the only thing that's original is the dials and the chassis. You could replace everything in the unit. Personal opinion, it wouldn't be worth doing. Um, especially on this unit, taking that approach, we have some really high uh, wattage resistors that are adjustable. We also we are also going to find some really high precision resistors. So doing a complete component restoration on this, one, will destroy the settling that the unit's been doing, but two, it could be overkill with a part that may or may not introduce some more failure. So this resistive section in here, this is going to be just fine. We can leave all of this alone, and I would actually recommend leaving that alone. So in terms of restoration candidate, this particular unit looks like a good potential. We have some work to do, but it's not a exorbitant amount of work to bring what could be a very beneficial unit back up to service in the lab. And I think we're going to actually give it a shot. So this will be a future project on the channel. We will restore this together and go forward and see what it does from there. But more information on CRTs. When taking a look at a unit that has a CRT, one thing to know is these CRTs all have an hour counter in them. It's not a uh, visible hour counter, but it is a how many hours can the CRT be displaying something before it runs out of electrons to smash into phosphor. We can equate that to brightness. Uh, one of the good things that I do when I'm looking at photos of devices, knowing that cameras are more sensitive to the green than our eyes are, is I take a look at where the brightness knob is and how bright the trace is on the screen. If the brightness is cranked all the way over here and the trace is barely visible on the screen, the unit either has some high voltage problems or it has a weak and tired tube. And it may be a, a quite difficult repair candidate at that point. Um, for whatever reason, the 576s are really, really known for that. I fixed five curve tracers for the lab. I've got two 576s and three 577s, so I've got quite a few. But uh, with all of that, I did have to retube. Actually, I had to retube one of the 576s and I had to retube one of the 577s because of a weak CRT. And there's nothing I can do to fix that, unfortunately. The rejuvenators and stuff like that, they, they're kind of a false sense of hope because they, the, they blast the tube and it comes back, but it only comes back for about an hour and a half, two hours. doesn't come back for long. So I have not run into a reliable, good, and long way of bringing a very tired tube back to service. I know there are some special shops that are doing some television restorations where they're actually restoring the CRTs. They're replacing components in the gun, uh, in the electron gun, to get them back up to operation. They're, they're cutting the neck of the CRT, pulling the innards out, the phosphor layer and everything like that staying, and then they're reattaching a new electron gun element, re-pulling the vacuum on the CRT, and essentially rejuvenating it, because the phosphor is fine. It's the cathodes that die. <laughs> they, they stop producing electrons. For those that would like a very deep dive into CRT specifically, the cathode ray tube by Peter Keller is a fantastic book that goes into CRTs of all types, um, from radar to instrumentation to data display, avionics, photo recording, monochrome and color television tubes. If it's a CRT, there's at least some information in there in this book by Peter Keller, and I am quite glad it's on the shelf in the lab. It gets referenced from time to time. So when you're taking a look at pictures, look at the intensity control, see how bright the CRT is. If it's way over here, it's not such a great sign unless it's blowing out the camera with the brightness of the tube. I have seen pictures taken that way. I hope they're not running the tubes that, that hard for that long because that's really hard on the tubes. But at that point, it's not my piece of equipment, so I can't say anything. Uh, horrible burn-in on a CRT can actually... You can see it when the tube is off 
So if you see any kind of ghosting image on the tube, things like that, especially on one of these uh, tech scopes that had the readout, if you see any kind of burn in in the readout, uh, that would be here, 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 or here. That's a pretty good sign that the, that the um, CRT has been run hard. At least the readout turned up quite brightly, as well as the CRT has been run long. So, not the greatest solution. One other thing to note is VFDs down here. This is a very dim. You can see how bright that got over here. I'll start this up one more time. Watch over here when it, as it boots up. Get real bright for a second, then go out. This VFD is starting to get dim, especially on these frequency counters. The, the, the frequency counters seem to take the brunt of it, at least for right now, because they're just left on burning and, and things like that. Eight and a half digit meters, too. Uh, probably the seven and a half digit stuff. The VFDs have some have some hours on them. Much different to my newer frequency counter, which has a LCD display on it. And you'll notice it dimmed it dimmed down. Uh, one of the things I've done is on all my units that have LCDs, my meters, the source measure unit, power supply, and then the frequency counter. Any of the stuff that stays on for a long, 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 long time. Frequency counters especially, because they can stay on for days at a time, depending on the testing that I'm doing. I have the brightness turned way down. I have the sleep states turned on the screens, things like that. It's just so they don't age as rapidly with, with the hours on them. The source measure unit is uh, also like that, as is the 7.5-digit meter. Um, it, it stays on for hours and days at a time, depending on what we're testing, so... Definitely want to make sure the screen doesn't die on it before it's time and I get and I get the use out of it that we need. Purpose built measuring equipment. A um, couple of things that come to mind. Color saturation meter for broadcast television, uh, curve tracer, things like that. One of my 576 tubes that still has a lot of life left in it has some burn in it. It has a burn in dot here, a burn in dot here, and a burn in dot up here. That's perfectly normal and normal wear and tear on that tube. The center dot would be for the AC function as it sweeps back and forth. This would be for NPN. This would be for PNP. And um, so having those dots in there just means that the tubes actually had some life on it, but it's not overly, it's not, it's not problematic to using the piece of equipment. So a couple of, a couple of burn ins where it's normal for a CRT to be burned in especially on dedicated measuring equipment, color saturation for broadcast television, and a few other things. Um, perfectly normal, and I wouldn't throw out a piece of equipment for that, or I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't pass over a piece of equipment for that as long as it uh, still functioned and had good brightness. That was such a problem on the curve tracers that on the 577, Tech implemented a dimming function on the screen for when the... Uh, collector was turned down it would actually bring the screen intensity down and then when you gave it a little bit of collector it'd bring it back up so you could actually see the traces so auto dimmers were actually built in some of the tech scopes actually have auto dimmers built in too a couple that come to mind are the 7104 the 7904 7904a they have um if the trace is static for too long it'll bring the brightness down to help protect the tube especially in the 7104A. I need to work on getting one of those in front of the camera. Also, have a little bit of forgiveness for yourself. You can't see everything in pictures. You can't know everything. There's going to be some stuff that's going to get, that's going to squeak by, and it's just going to happen. I have ordered the wrong connectors before. I have ordered the wrong parts before. I've ordered the wrong test equipment before. This is all stuff that's going to happen over time. Just kind of roll with it, and hopefully the um, the dollar figure is kept to a minimum. That's the goal. But mistakes are going to be made. Um, I've learned a lot from getting myself in trouble and then getting myself out of it many, many times. <laughs> so just some things we've had over the uh, over the years. So 
everything is a learning experience. Right, wrong, good, bad, fix, no fix. Everything can teach you something. So I hope this was helpful, and keep at it. And uh, check out the Patreon page if you'd want a little bit more. Hit the subscribe button, the bell, and hang around. I am in the comment section in between videos, and I will, as always, more's on the way, and I'll see everybody in the next video.